Welcome, everybody, to this week's Coach Ed Show. I am so excited, like I always am, but I'm especially excited this week uh, to share this man with you. And also, he's he's sharing himself with me. And I've just gotten to got to know Dan a couple of months ago and on a really a, a happenstance meeting. And I always like to say that I thought I had 15 minutes with him and we spent an hour and a half together. So if that just tells you anything about who this man is and how much he cares about people, that's what really sh- stood out. Uh, to me. So the things that I would say about um, the person you see on the screen is positive, joyful, a resilient, I would say, hardworking, lover of life. That's not a word, that's a phrase, but that's how I, I would describe him. And I'm just so excited to share Dan Carlson with you in the Coach Ed Show. Dan, welcome to the Coach Ed Show. Ah, good to be here, Taylor. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Well, why don't you give us a level set, kind of give everybody an idea of uh, where you are right now, wh- where you're sitting, kind of your your current stage of life, and then maybe do a little rewind and kind of back us up to maybe your childhood and, and talk a little bit about that. But let us get to know just a little bit of overview of it. I'll be more than happy to, yeah, I've I'm blessed. I, I've uh, I've lived quite a life, and I've had a lot of experiences, and met so many great people that have that I've not only learned from, but that have shaped my life and made me who I am today. That that I am very grateful for. But my, as you mentioned, my name's Dan Carlson. I'm the deputy athletic director here at the University of Alabama Birmingham, otherwise known as, and um, I am in my thirty. First year uh, full time working in college athletics, and I started three years before that as a student assistant while I was in undergrad. If yeah. you want to count that, so 34 <laughs> years in college we'll athletics, count it. We'll count 30, it. <laughs> 30, 31 in some capacity, uh, working with it in a more full time basis. I'll be the first to admit I never, never thought I'd be living in Birmingham, Alabama, but. Life will take you places, and God will lead you places sometimes that we don't we don't know. We just got to follow, and and uh, when you do those things, good things happen, and you end up in good places around good people. And so I'm a guy that I born the youngest of four children. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and my father. I don't think he was in medical school at the time, and I can't tell you that. He was probably looking to have a fourth child while he was in medical school, but here I here I popped along and uh, for him and my mom and and so uh, I was born in Kansas City while he was in medical school. He had four mouths to feed, and this is in the early days. Like when I say the early days, the first two years of the NFL. Okay. And so my dad moonlighted, and his second job was he worked for the Kansas City Chiefs. Being an athletic trainer in the NFL wasn't like it is today. Yeah. I mean, that was basically, they used to rub a little dirt on, on it and tape it up and throw you back out. And so he was an athletic trainer on the very first two Super Bowls with, you know, the old timers would know like the Lynn Dawson's and the Bobby Bells and the Buck Buchanan's and guys like that. And so, and Hank Stram was the head coach. And so he was on those first two teams and, and then uh, he graduated medical school. We moved to Dallas, Texas when I was three. He was on an airplane one day flying from Dallas to Charlotte and he flew over and that's back in the days when the pilot used to come on there and say, we're currently flying over such and such city and yeah. we should be in Charlotte in 25 minutes or whatever. And below us currently is Knoxville, Tennessee. And my dad was looking out the window and he saw these mountains and lakes and he thought it was the most beautiful place he had ever seen. And he just picked up the family and moved out there and got an office. Uh, to start his medical practice in Knoxville, and that's how we, that's how we ended up there when I was five years old. Knoxville wow. still it's home for me. Mm-hmm. My brother was a, gr- a very good athlete, and my dad being in sports medicine, I'd just been around athletics my whole life, and it's kind of what I knew as well. I was a four sport athlete in high school, so I lettered in football, basketball, track, and tennis, and uh, loved it. I you know I wasn't I wasn't one of those great high school athletes that I work with you know. Working in college athletics, I work with high-level college athletes. Yeah, yeah. I was not one of those individuals. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not ever going to claim to be like I was some great uh, world beater athlete. But I was a, I was a good, really good little high school athlete that uh, you know was competitive, gym rat. 
you yeah. weren't going to outwork me. And, uh, yeah. and so I didn't have many opportunities to uh, play college football. I had some division three and NAI schools and they were offering me books and very minimal money. And the coach up at Walter State Community College, which is a really good junior college, had offered me an opportunity to come up there and play uh, junior college basketball. And I'd accepted it because I had two friends that I'd played a lot of AAU ball and stuff with, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, were going up there. And so I took that opportunity. And uh, two weeks before school started, I was going to pick up my best friend that had signed a football scholarship at Tennessee and uh, pick up him and his mom to go up to the water skiing one last time for the summer uh, before we both reported for fall camp. And little did I know on my way on a little two-lane rural road that my life would change forever. You know, you, you never, you know, the beautiful Saturday morning, July 23rd, 1988. I still remember the day, remember the sounds, remember even the dang car radio I was listening to. I had a old time cassette tape this is oh yeah before cds and i i ipods and i'm going down the road and listening to this you know uh holland oats this group from the 80s that a lot of people that are older would know and uh yeah i'm just i'm listening to the words of one of these songs that they have and i'm thinking how blessed i really was you know i was lucky i had a really good high school life you know i had a nice you know nice car nice I had a great family, had great friends, had a beautiful girlfriend. I was going to play college basketball. Life was good for Dan Carlson as I finished up my senior year. And I was just thinking how grateful and blessed I was in my life. The song came on on the radio by Hall and & Oates, and it was like, If you have everything your heart desired, would you still want more? Yeah. And I can just remember thinking of those words, and little did I know that in that moment while that song was on, you know, I was looking ahead and about 200 yards ahead in this little two-lane road, I noticed a car was kind of over the dotted line. And, you know, we are all human. Like, how many times have you driven, Taylor, any of the any of the people listening today, driven on a little road and, you know, you've noticed a car go over the dotted line for a second. But usually someone gets back over. It's kind of, yeah. you, know, you, you know, they'll yeah. get over for a quick second. Yeah. Well, in this case, you know, I thought that was going to happen. And, you know, 200 yards becomes 150 yards. And the cars, instead of kind of drifting back over in the right lane, you know, in it's, its correct lane, now it's drifting over more over the line. Yeah. And 150 yards becomes 100 yards. Yeah. And it seems like a really long distance. But when you have two cars going opposite directions, that gap closes in a matter of a few seconds. Then before I knew it, it's about 50 yards. And I'm noticing this car is now almost fully head on in my lane. Wow. And you got to make a split second decision. Well, I had to make that. And my decision was, do I hit a car head on or do I swerve and avoid head on collision? Yeah. I did what any of us would have done. I had my seatbelt on, but I swerved and avoided head on collision. And when I did, my car went off an embankment and rolled down this little ravine mm -hmm. and it flipped three times. And it was in the flipping of the vehicle that my the whiplash of the vehicle is what snapped my neck mm. and i broke my neck at the c5 cervical in a complete spinal cord injury and the car finally quit rocking and landed upside down mm. and i can remember when the car finally quit rocking and stopped i was hanging upside down i'm thinking to myself first of all am i alive is this yeah. like is this a dream or like and I, all i could think about was okay i'm here and so I just, I reached down to turn the keys off, the power off, you know, the radio was still blaring. Huh. And as I reached down, my hand about halfway towards the keychain fell limp. And hmm. it took a second for the brain waves to send a signal down the spinal cord that it was injured. Hmm. And when my arm went limp, that's when I'm like, oh my God, I can't move. I'm totally like, I didn't hmm. know I was like permanently paralyzed. I just knew at that moment I couldn't move and I thought my body might be in a state of shock mm -hmm. you know and I, none of us would think it's like okay this is what this injury really is then I'm like okay I'm panicked and this is the days before cell phones or mm -hmm. bluetooth to call out none of that none of that was involved so I'm down there and I'm thinking okay somebody's going to come down here and check on me mm-hmm
Well, unfortunately, the gentleman that ran me off the road, he just kept on going after he ran me off and didn't stop. And I really didn't realize how far away I was from other people. Okay. And I was in a very rural area. And so no one else saw it. And I was off the road far enough down this ravine. Nobody could really see me down there. And I am just blessed to this day that this little old gentleman, they told me all about him. I've ne I, I never really got a chance to meet him. Yeah. Wish I would have. But this yeah. little old man that lived somewhere a couple hundred yards away was mowing his yard on a riding lawnmower and just happened to be looking out while he was mowing and saw the two cars and knew that whoever was run off the road was probably either dead or injured very bad. Mm -hmm. and, but this gentleman did not own a phone. And so uh -huh. he had to get off his mower and go in his you know, house, get his car keys, get in his little pickup truck and drive about 15 minutes to the little, little nearest mini mark called Weigel's. And he made an, on a pay phone, a 911 call. Wow. And so it was 45 minutes before I ever heard a human voice. So that, that during that entire time, I'm, I'm hanging upside down. I'm just like praying, saying so many prayers that Lord, see, please let someone find me. Yeah. Uh, please don't let this be the way I go out and stuff. Yeah. And, and fortunately someone did and came and when, you know, and yeah, I'll try and I don't want to spare your listeners details of Stephen King, but it's too, it's almost crazy. So I knocked over a hill of fire ants. So while I'm hanging upside down, I start no feeling something on my face. My face is the only area I can feel. Okay. And I start feeling and it's fire ants. Oh so my. I got fire ants crawling on my face. And I never knew the second part until I came out of ICU and the rescue squad worker came and visited me in the hospital. I was in ICU about two and a half weeks where I was out. And they had me all morphined up and all that after the yeah. surgeries. And, and when I came out, he told me all what happened and told me about the gentleman that had found me and had called it in. But he, he told me what took them so long because you did the normal thing. When you heard a human voice, you're like, help, hurry, yeah. you know, and stuff. Right. You, yeah, but you're happy, but you're panicking a little bit. Yeah. He's like, be, we'll, be, we'll get you out and stuff. Well, I didn't know what was taking so long. Well, what happened was a copperhead snake had crawled itself in the around the steering column of my car. And literally in my lap, I couldn't see it because I couldn't raise my head because my neck was broken. And I have a phobia of snakes. So by the, <laughs> thank God I did not see that snake or I would have probably not be here today. I would have passed out and probably had more brain damage. Although some people may argue I have enough already. But, um, but anyway, so they had to get a long prong pole before they could get the jaws of life to cut me out of the car. They had to pull the snake out of the, uh, out of the steering wheel to get to me. So I never knew that. I'm glad I never knew wow. that. But when I got to the hospital at the ER, my older sister was an ER nurse. I happened okay. to be working that day. Whoa. That's the last thing I really remember for about two and a half, three weeks yeah. is my sister holding my hand trying to keep me calm, but I saw tears in her eyes. And I think they had told her what they thought the initial diagnosis was and mm -hmm. it was a spinal cord injury. And that was something that I, you know, that was really hard. So yeah. I spent an entire year in the hospital yeah. recovering from the injury. The first half of that year was in local rehab, rehab and hospitals in Knoxville. And then I was very fortunate to get sent to one of the best rehab facilities in the United States in Atlanta, Georgia, the Shepherd Spinal Center. And I did my last five and a half months of rehab down there. And it was a life changer. They, they really gave me a new lease on life and, and a lot of positive people that really, and people that look like me that work there, uh, that were people that had careers. One of the guys I looked up to more than anything and have learned more in life about still one of my good friends was a gentleman that, you know, he was wearing a tie and dressed up and I found out he was married and actually had kids mm -hmm. and went to college and all these things. And I'm like, cause there's not a lot of people sometimes that look like myself and you, you need those positive role models. Yes. And I saw someone that had kind of, and was out there living a normal life and it gave you hope because yeah. you didn't see a lot of that oftentimes. And so I'm really fortunate, but while I was in the hospital, 
and I think I've shared this with you before, Taylor, is was a really, really important happening in my life to where I am today. Mm -hmm. is I went through, I'm very lucky because we all go through when something goes wrong in our life, the pity party. And it's very easy for us to have pity. And why me? We all, we're human. Every yeah. one of us at some point in life when something really tragic or, or hard in life happens, it's like, why me? I'm, yeah. I'm living a good life. I'm doing the right things. Why am I the one that's paying for all this mm. when the persons that aren't doing the right things go, you know, and don't, that seems like nothing wrong ever happens to them. Yeah. And that's exactly how I felt. And not only was I having that, but at the same time I was having this pity party, I was also had all this burning hate in my heart and it was eating me up because I was mad. I found out they found the gentleman that ran me off the road on that day. And it turns out as a gentleman that went to high school with me was a year ahead of me in high school and was a drug dealer back in high school. And whether or not he was doing anything uh, illegal or anything that day or not, he ran me off, kept on going, and never checked back. He said he was looking at his uh, glove compartment for a pack of cigarettes, saw something red go by him and didn't bother looking back. And at first, I had all this hate. Yeah. And it was eating me up, and I was wearing one of those halos, on your yeah. head where you can't move your head at all and mm -hmm. they drill it into your skull and it's, it's pretty painful. And so you're laying there mm -hmm. and it was about three thirty AM on in the morning and I was just crying, you know, and I'm like, Lord, I can't live like this. Something's got to change. The things that came over me are just hard to explain. But all I knew is I prayed to God that night that something had to change. I can't live this life like this. And it was so much because of hate and pity in my heart. Mm. And I don't know how to explain it, but I woke up that next morning and I had a sense of peace I've never felt before in my life. And the peace I woke up with is somehow, some way, and I can't explain to anything but the Holy Spirit, is that I woke up with a sense of forgiveness in my heart. And I, I can't explain it. Yeah. I forgave the guy that ran me off that day. And from then on, it's like when I gave up and had forgiveness towards someone, my life started moving forward and all the great things started working in, in my favor. And it was, it was a huge life lesson for me of how hatred and the anger can weigh us down and really keep us from reaching our potential of who we are. And it kind of sets the stage for the rest of my career. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that career, but I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to ask any questions if you want to before I get off on that, on that tangent. It's an incredible story. I mean, it really is. I mean, all the way, well, it's an incredible story anyway, but just that what happened to you that night and just your words that you just shared right there, forgiveness unlocked something in your life that enabled you to be who you are today and do the things that you're able to do today. Man, I'm so glad you shared that part of the story. That That is truly amazing. You heard a man that has been in uh, college athletics for 34 years. And one thing that um, maybe our listeners noticed as you've talked is that you have to adjust. All they can see right now is is about right here, right below your neck. And you look there, but I don't know if you can even roll back or anything. But what are you doing when you're kind of moving around there? That's a great point. Obviously, I've got this board that I use. And as you can see, I'm in a, a power wheelchair to move around. That obviously is my legs now. There you as go. far as getting me around and... I've been in it so long that I don't even hardly realize it anymore. Yeah. But what I am doing is part of my injury is this, with the spinal cord is that it basically you lose the use of your, well, your diaphragm is what you use to help get your big breaths yeah. of air and oxygen. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're talking for a long time, like I am, you're using a lot of oxygen. Mm. And so by doing this and sometimes going back and forth, it kind of creates additional lung space mm. when you kind of move and it gives you a little bit more of a breath when you're talking a long time. People sometimes think, is that a nervous tick? And it's not a nervous tick. Yeah. I just do it and I don't realize it because it's just part of me now. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> when, when I'm not talking as much, I probably am not moving as much, but, uh, well, that means but, you're moving a whole lot. Cause I don't, I've only been, we haven't been around each other a whole, whole long time, but I can tell you this much, either me or you've been talking the whole time we've been together. So <laughs> awesome. 
I don't want to gloss over another point you made just a minute ago where you said how you seeing other guys that look like you really moving on with their life, really having a career, you know, being married, like gave you hope, like how important role models are not only for a, a person that may be with your condition, but what other conditions of, of maybe people may say is disadvantage or, or circumstantial, like the power of role models in, in your situation right? and in other difficult situations. We all need people to look up to and people that have kicked in a door, they have broken barriers. Someone we just kind of look up to is that's what I want to be in life. You know, I used to study these things we had called media guides. <laughs> where every like football team or basketball had a media guide. Yep. I used to go through the University of Tennessee. That was like, oh, my dream was to work in that university. I'd look through their staff directory and I just thought, oh my, that's so glamorous. Look at all those people in those positions. And yeah, yeah I would get excited about, you know, I'd see someone that was like the concession, concession manager for the university. And I was like, wow, that would be an awesome job and stuff, you know, and it didn't matter. I was just excited, like, as a, as a young person. Yeah. And yeah. that was a dream, but I never knew how you could get to that point. Yeah. And that kind of that kind of led me to, to how I kind of got started in this all together. And maybe you were going to share this, but I want to make sure you start with you coming back from Shepherd, getting back That's to right. Knoxville, and the role that your dad played when you got back, I think that's a really good and important story. Absolutely. I'll never forget that the day my dad picked me up. It was a full year after I'd had my injury. Okay. We were in late July. It was two weeks before fall classes started back. And my dad's picking me up in Atlanta to drive me back to Knoxville. And he's like, he, he has this conversation. So son, what are you going to do now that you're out of the hospital? And I was like, I can't wait. I said, I just can't wait to get home. I'm just going to chill. I've been yeah. in a hospital for a year. I'm ready to chill, Dad. And, yes, the word chill was still We used, used that. It. You and I used even, that word. Yeah, <laughs> even in the 80s, we were using chill. And my, da and my dad probably didn't even know what the word He's like, yeah, chilling's good. And he goes, he goes yeah, you got, he goes, you got two weeks to chill. Mm. And then we've got you enrolled in classes already. And I'm kind of like what like i didn't know but what it was was it was tough love my father and my family they never treated me any different taylor it was um the goals and the expectations for us didn't change yeah. our goal was for you to go and get a college education and graduate that didn't change because you had a, an injury and a major disability yeah. the goal stayed the same and it was that tough love of not babying me and being easy on me and saying, oh, poor kid, he just got out of the hospital and he's had this traumatic. I didn't, at that time, I couldn't hardly write. Even with the splint I have on my arm, yeah. I couldn't, at that time, I couldn't hardly write. We didn't have assistive technology on computers like we mm -hmm. do. We didn't have computers, <laughs> right. first of all. like So there wasn't anything. And so I... I, remember those big husky pencils we used to use as a kid oh, yeah. to learn to write with? Yeah. And so I would get, I got like a notepad. I put one of those in this splint and I could get about 10 words on a piece of paper. I'd be trying to take notes. Wow. And so what I'd always do is I'd find somebody in class that always looked way smarter than me. And I would always ask them at the end of class, yeah, like a, before a test if I could make copies of their notes mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and most people would be happy to do so. And if I didn't, I, I didn't normally have a problem with it because I could talk to anybody. Yeah. But the teachers, if I asked them, they would usually find someone that wanted to volunteer and would make photocopies. And so that way I had good notes to review before our exams and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah. yeah. And then we did have word processors had just come out. So that was your extent of your computers. Yeah. Yeah. You could type, and print on a dot matrix computer type thing. Yeah. And so that's how I type my college papers using okay. a, I take that same Husky pencil, turn it backwards, put it in the splint and use like typing sticks. Okay. And, yeah. And type, type, yeah. Away, yeah. Yep. Packing away. And so you had to learn to adapt. And yeah. so I'm competitive. Nobody cares when you get to college, what grade you're in, but yeah. that competitiveness in me, I felt bad because I felt like I was a year behind. 
because oh. all my buddies had had a year ahead of me mm. and I was determined to graduate on time. And so what I did is I started right back full time. I didn't go part time. It was full time. And after I got that first semester under my belt, then I was off and yeah. to the races. And so I went my first year to college back to the University of Tennessee on that first year, just taking general basic courses, mm -hmm. figuring out what I wanted to major in. But one of my nurses at the Shepherd Center was married to a college basketball coach at the University of Georgia. And she said she got to know me really, really well. She's like a big sister to me even to this day. Wow. And she goes, would you ever want to meet my husband? She goes, you're eating up with sports. <laughs> and I think you and my husband will hit it off. He works in college sports. And he's the one that taught me and planted the seed in a career in sports administration. Mm. I didn't even know a career in that really existed, that, right. there, was a degree, that there was a college degree in it. Mm -hmm. And so I basically... Once again, there was no computers, so I had to go to the library, and you had to get microfish. Yeah. And I found an article, the top sport administration schools in the country. How about that? And uh, at the time, it's not like today. There weren't as many. There might have been 30 or 40 in the country. Yeah. yeah. But number one is probably still one of the, probably one of the top ones still today, Ohio University yeah. in Athens, Ohio. Yep. But I don't do cold weather because part of my injury is I get cold easy. True, true. So that, that nut nicks Ohio U out of the process. And number two was St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida. That's more my weather type scene. So I took yeah. a visit and my parents were scared to let me go a thousand miles away from home with my high level of disability. But I sweet talked them enough and, and they finally agreed. And I, I went down there and finished up my undergrad. And I ended up graduating college in three years and a summer a total and ended up graduating before any of my high school buddies. Uh, still, even that had a year ahead of me. Uh, it's that competitiveness. And I did a second major and then went to grad school. And my senior year, I worked in the, the media relations office during undergrad. Okay. And my senior year was lucky enough to land a internship with the Miami Dolphins. And that was back when you know, Don Shula and Dan Marino and those guys were all there. Yeah. Now I was a peon. I was a nobody. And it was funny, Mike Shula, the future coach of the University of Alabama, was also working in that office in player personnel. How about that? Uh, he was still higher up than I mean, I was one step below a peon. Yeah, yeah. And but that experience, I learned a lot being around that setting and, and player personnel. And it actually helped land me an opportunity to work full time at the University of Tennessee mm. and go to grad school and get my grad school paid for at the University of Tennessee while working in football recruiting. Mm -hmm. And it was the first year of a, a head coach there by the name of Philip Fulmer. And my very first recruiting class included Peyton Manning. Uh, he was a high school senior at the time at Isidore Newman High School in New Orleans when we recruited him. And so we had a really good run of four straight top five recruiting classes. The four years I worked full time there while I went to grad school and did two masters and we won the national championship in year five uh, with those classes. And I left and then went to Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. I was there a little bit reunited with that guy that was the assistant coach at the University of Georgia. Oh, wow. He had become head basketball coach at Mercer. Wow. So we are now there together. And uh, the guy that kind of put me on my way, and his name is Mark Sloniker. And then from there, I was off to Georgia Tech in Atlanta and spent almost three and a half, four years there, and then returned home to the University of Tennessee uh, and started working as the director of football academics for the University of Tennessee, again, working yeah, with the yeah. coach I'd worked with earlier. And now I'm on the, gone from recruiting to the academic side and working as a counselor and coordinator of all those things. I'm working with some unbelievable future NFL players and just great young people in general. And I also worked with several women's sports mm -hmm. in addition to that. So I had about four sports I, I coordinated mm -hmm. and then had an opportunity to move over to fundraising and development and reunite with a guy named Mark Ingram, who's the AD now here at UAB. Mm -hmm. But this is our, that's our second time working together. And now we're doing fundraising and development and he eventually leaves and goes to Temple. I stay at Tennessee and continue kind of moving up and uh he gets the ad job at uab and then calls me uh to get see if i'll join him 
and I didn't think I was leaving the University of Tennessee. I was back in my dream job, my dream, yeah. my home, spent 19 total years up there. Never thought I was going to leave. I just felt a calling that there was something more for me out there yeah. and that I was being led to leave everything comfortable that where I was, I was in a very comfortable situation and I, I needed to challenge myself and mm. start new in a new place in a new position with a lot of responsibility yeah. and grow in a lot of areas that I had, I had goals. I, I always wanted to be a sport administrator and oversee some sports and departments. And in that role now I get, you know, I've got seven sports. I oversee four different departments. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of responsibility, but I've grown. It's helped me professionally, but it's very fulfilling. Yeah. And I've uh, been very, very blessed along the way yeah. to work with just some amazing, amazing people that make me look really, really good. Well, you are a tremendous leader too. And uh, it's easy to follow great leaders. You know, I think you bring out the best of people. Great leaders bring out the, great, uh, the best of people. And, and I know that you do that. You know, again, I listened to that story again. I could hear it again and again. Well, now we got it recorded. I can listen to it as much as I want to now. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it's just amazing to hear that journey. It really is, and knowing that it wasn't it wasn't easy, and it's never an easy journey. But especially when when you are in a shape where you've got to use a wheelchair to navigate things and 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 there's some different challenges that you have that other people just don't have and, and you may have already said it and you probably have in this interview already but what was it that that drove you to really achieve really overcome really not rest on your laurels as they as they say what what was it that just kept you p pushing well, you know, when one door closed on my ability to compete as an athlete, okay. even though I, as I told you at the very beginning, you know, I was just a decent, good old high school athlete, wasn't a great, yeah, I'm with you. but it didn't mean I was any less competitive. If anything, I made up for a lot of my lack of skill set by will to win and, and will to compete. Yeah. And so I think it's either in you or, or, or not. And, mm. you know, I, I worked with a, a football coach at the University of Tennessee, an assistant, and he said something. He was using it for recruiting, but I think it's a lot that we can take in life, too. And it, you'll have to forgive this analogy, but okay. he's talking about the the kids that he liked to recruit. And he goes, I'd rather recruit a kid that I got to say, whoa, 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 and, and, hold, and pull them back because they're they're ready to go than a kid that I got to say sick him. And what he means by that is he goes, I can coach the parts of teaching them the fundamentals and teach them how to stay within a structure, yeah. but I can't coach m motivation and getting up and doing the stuff. And yeah. so he wanted someone that's, that's got that built in DNA. They're ready to go. Yeah. And I don't have to motivate them. I'll teach them the rest. Yeah. And I'll, I'll pull the reins back if they need to kind of be pulled in. Yeah. But I can't teach it. But a young person that has all the talent, but they just don't have the drive. Yeah. I can't motivate them. Yeah. And there's not, they either have it or they don't. That, that will to want to win and be competitive. Yeah. And I think I have a little bit of the first part. Yeah. That's kind of driven it. And I think a lot of that, as you said that, I, it made me think of something. And, and I think a lot of it's just my older brother. My older brother's my right. hero. Okay. That's my hero. My brother's five years older than me. He was a he was a much better athlete than I was, much smarter than I am, which is why he's a medical doctor, and I work in college athletics. Um, but he was an overachiever. Okay. And my brother's the hardest working human being I've ever met in my life. Wow. He outworks everybody, and my competitiveness, and it's hard for me to say that. Cause I like to pride myself on being be more competitive. and it's hard, but I've come to learn. I can't outwork Mike Carlson. That guy is, he's, he's a warrior and he is, he's my, he's been that compass because as, as a young kid, you want to like, yeah, you know, he was physically more mature than I am yeah. five, you know, as a, as a boy, Yeah. but we're boys and we play, he plays, we played sports all the time and he kicked my butt mm. always growing up. And nothing you want to do more in life than to beat your big brother. Yeah, growing up, and 
it was like defeat, 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 defeat. And finally, when I got to be about a junior in high school, all of a sudden it, we started evening up. And like when I first finally beat my brother and and when we would go out in the yard and play hoops and stuff, man, that, it was so like reward. I got so much <laughs> enjoyment. And then I started growing and getting bigger than he was and everything. And now, now I was winning my share of them. Mm. And he was so strong competitiveness he it didn't sit well with him you know so there were a lot of fight we've went at it those were legendary but they made me who i am yeah and my brother had just gotten admitted into medical school when i had my accident there's no guarantees you get readmitted to medical school and i literally had moved him up three weeks before my accident to medical school Hmm. And he had just gotten married himself, was married only a month before that, and moved him up to medical school. And lo and behold, three weeks later, he gets a call that his little brother, uh, you know, had suffered a major injury. Mm -hmm. And I get emotional talking about it because, but him and my sister-in-law, who's just an angel, they made the decision to withdraw from medical school and be there that first year of my life. Wow. to get me back up on my feet, so to speak. And my brother, he was in there in rehab with me, and he wouldn't let me take a rep off. Mm. It, by gosh, if I'm sitting out, you're going to work, you know, and I, we're going to do it together. And, you know, and whatever he had to find to motivate me, he and I are huge Rocky fans. Yeah. <laughs> he would get that CD or that, that, that you know, soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And we he'd play those in rehab, he'd play those Rocky mo- you know, wow. songs. And there was an Elton John song called I'm Still Standing. Yeah. And it goes, I'm still standing better than I've ever been, mm-hmm. you know, feeling like a true survivor, you know, feeling like a little kid. And the words resonated because mm-hmm. it's like, okay, I've taken the best shot. You know, yeah. All right, I've taken this shot, but I'm still standing and I'm yeah. coming back and I'm going to be better wow. than ever before. And so it's those types of things that just kept me motivated. So I'm not here today because of me. Mm. I'm here. I'm a product of unbelievable people that poured into Dan Carlson yeah. to make him who he is today. We didn't get here on our own. And, and my brother's just one of those, but he's a foundational rock. And he's, he's always made me want to be better at whatever I am, a better man, better family man, better Christian. He's still my big brother and we're a lot more equal, but I still look up to him to this day because he embodies what I want to be. Wow. Yet, yet another example of the power of a role model, the power of someone in your life that you can look up to, that you, that pours into you, that, that has, has no agenda, but you, uh, you know, sacrificial person. I heard sacrifice in that story. Man, that is amazing. You know, just that competitiveness really helped you. Him him pushing you, your dad making those tough choices early on, your brother making a sacrifice and being there with you, seeing those role models at Shepherd, and now you are that for so many others. You know, that's what I see. So just You know, and, and I, it took my entire family. I yeah, you know, my older sister is a nurse, helped out a lot and her husband. Yeah. They absolutely. helped out a lot. And then my oldest sister, Susie. Uh, I think I may have shared this with you for our family. You talk about a lot of going through a lot. My poor parents, not only were they dealing with me, two months after my injury, my oldest sister, Susie, was on her way to visit me in the hospital and got hit by a tractor trailer and suffered a traumatic brain injury. Mm. And she was in it. So I was on one hospital on one side of not. So she was in a coma for nine weeks in a coma on the other side of the city, two wow. months after my accident. Oh my goodness. So we're both in the hospital at the same time. And, you know, my sister's, she had permanent brain damage and she's able to talk and communicate and, and, but you know, her, there was some significant deficits that she suffered. Yeah. She was never able to work again. Yeah. And she has a lot of mobility impairments that also went with her head injury. So, to say my poor parents, they've been there and back. Yeah. And so we had to all kind of pull together and go through, a, you know, it was a lot for my family, but it, it gets back to the resiliency. A lot can happen in our lives. It's traumatic. Yeah. And it's this, what are we going to do? It's, you know, because what I've learned in life, if we want to play the victim, people will feel sorry for us, you know, for maybe, maybe six months mm. and they'll keep calling and they'll check and they'll want to be there. 
But after about six months, people usually, they don't mean to, but they have lives to live and they move on. And especially if you're negative, they won't stay around very long. Right. And those people will leave your life altogether because they they can only handle so much negativity and they want to choose to be around people that want to help themselves. Yeah. And so luckily from in my situation, it's like you had a choice. Do I feel sorry for myself or do I accept it and move on? And I cho- chose the latter. Let's let's hit on that topic, because I know that's a topic you and I talked about before, about what you and I both see is a, a lack of resiliency right now in in the young men and young women. And again, we would both acknowledge that, and even in in the condition, my condition, our ages, our times we grew up, there's a lot young people have to deal with that we didn't have to deal with uh, just from a social media perspective, a cultural perspective, the globalization uh, and this, the, the exposure of things that we are, they are exposed to that we never had to be exposed to that probably was protecting us a little bit. But even with that, what would you what would you say about resilience? What what would you say is is some good advice, or maybe even maybe take a shot at saying what you think the state of the state of the union is as far as resilience as you see in college athletics? And then what are what are some steps you think that uh, we could start doing? Even a young person could do, but even as mentors and leaders as you and I are, what are some of the things that we can do to start building rebuilding resilience in our young people? Absolutely. Wow. Resiliency is is a word that you're hearing more and more of, and not just in college athletics, but in colleges and universities across the country. Uh, They did a study a few years ago in higher education, and they were finding out what is the number one thing that students are liking entering colleges and universities in today's world. Mm -hmm. This was not athletics. This is just general general students. Got it. And resiliency was number one answer that they got that is the skill set that's most lacking and you and I are older than a lot of the students yeah. and a lot of the young professionals that we know or work with and so I can't be like back in the day this is what right. we used to do and yeah. and, and I can find myself wanting to revert to that mm-hmm. of you know of how we might have done it but we're living in a different generation yeah. than a lot of the young people are yeah. and I'm not going to make it in what I do as a living if I'm not adapting, I hope keeps me a little bit young. I like to think so. It keeps yeah, me young at heart. Yeah. It's also probably why I have a lot less hair on this podcast. <laughs> and what I do have is a lot more gray. It's a societal thing. Oftentimes the person that has been their, their parent or guardian that has, you know, kind of raised them, you're finding the relationships have changed a lot in the parental structure. Yeah. And their parents want to be their friends and sometimes not be the hardline person holding accountability or they have what they call in colleges and higher education helicopter parents where they do everything for the student athlete or or the student in general i mean and then they get to college or this age group and they drop them off on a college campus and for the first time in their life they're washing their own clothes or they're having to learn or they're having to make their own phone calls or they have to remember to turn in their homework because Mom and dad aren't there and they struggle because they weren't doing that when they were, things were getting done for them. Yeah. And I think that creates it. Then you throw in today's world with the new NCAA legislation. Now young people, instead of making a decision based on what is the best university where they'd be happy for four years, the best social structure, the best coaching staff, they think that they really like and feel like they're wanted and good people there. They're sometimes torn by the NIL dollars. Like I can get a, I can get a little bit more at this school than that school. So I'm going to go to school X because they're going to give me five thousand or ten thousand dollars more in NIL money. Yeah. And they make the decision based on financials. And I, and I can't, you know, I understand. But oftentimes, are they going to be happy? Right. And now you can transfer. Yeah. That just got approved for as many as you want. Oh, Whereas right. it was, you could only transfer once. Once, okay. And that now it's multiple transfers, so you could transfer every year. And there are certain situations where it's a good thing, and it works out. And sometimes yeah. people need the place they go. It might not have been what they thought. Yeah. And they get there, and they need a new change. Yeah. And they right. need a new, or maybe they, they went away from home, and all of a sudden some things happened back home 
with the family and they needed to be closer. Yeah. They need so there's some really good reasons why transferring does make sense as well, and that needs right. to be inputted. Right. Everyone expects they're going to come in from high school and, and play right, as a way. freshman. Yep. <laughs> and lots of times that's not the reality. You were a star in high school. If you're going to college and play sports, there's no doubt you were probably one of the elite players on your high school team. You're used to you know, being, the, being the person. Yep. And you expect college is going to be a lot of the same things. And then all of a sudden you realize everybody else on your team was also that same person you were. Yes. And there's only so many starting positions. And oftentimes you're not that person that gets to play Mm -hmm. that freshman and maybe even that sophomore year. And some people come in and they might have worked hard, but they get to college and they have a lot of freedom. And maybe they're not being as coachable as they needed to. Maybe they're not working as hard in the weight room and being, you know, and doing all the little things right and getting the extra work in when no one's watching. That word, you know, everyone always asks you about character. You know, character's what you do when no one's watching. And you know, what are you doing with your personal life, your, your work ethics, all the little things yeah. that make you who you are is you've got to develop that not when just someone's got their eye on you. Right. But when no one's around. What I hate is that when a young person is leaving because they're not playing and they, I know for a fact, they didn't work as hard as they needed to and give it everything they had. And they're oftentimes when things don't work out the way they wanted, instead of looking in the mirror and saying, what can I do to get better and improve myself? They take their ball and they go on to the next place. And it, then it's just a, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. And when you get in the work world someday, you're going to have bosses you don't like. You're going to work for people. You know, you may work for someone like myself and you just can't stand working with me <laughs> and and things of that nature. But you got to learn oftentimes in professional world, just like it is in the athletic world. Yeah. You got to be resilient enough to how do I figure it out of how do I make it work? Yeah. You know, if I if if, if someone's telling me I'm not doing, why is it that I'm not doing those things? Mm-hmm. And you ask for feedback. What can I do to get better? Be inquisitive. Have that conversation with your coach and say, I'm asking this in, in the best of ways. What things do you see for me that I need to improve on to put myself in an opportunity where I can compete for playing time? Right. Not exactly. You don't always want to say to be a star. If you're competing for playing time and you do all those little things, oftentimes you'll get that starting job. Mm-hmm. But you got to do all the little things. right. And so find out what that is and then don't let them just tell you. Follow up on it. You know, work on your weaknesses and make those weaknesses your strengths to where now they can't say, well, it's that. And force them, keep going back and getting as good as you can, doing everything to where they're like, gosh, dog, this person's taking the feedback we're giving them. We need to give them a shot. They're putting themselves in a position to compete. Those are the cases you love it. Is I love sometimes seeing that student that didn't play their freshman, sophomore year, but they kept working hard. They kept at it. And then that junior year, they break out, or their senior year, yeah. and they have that season, you're like, gosh, dog, you love that young person, because mm-hmm. they just kept grinding and grinding and didn't take no for an answer when times were hard. And so what coaches and administrators, what we can do is, a lot of times, young people may not have had discipline. Mm-hmm. We're finding this more and more. They get to college, and the worst thing we can do is not have a very disciplined type program and you got to hold people accountable but you, if you come in and everything's discipline 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 but you don't let the student athletes to know how much you love them yeah and how much you're invested in them as humans yes and you explain to them why it is that you're doing the things you are and that you love you but just like my dad was me it's that tough love we're gonna love you up we're gonna fight you give you give us your attention and you give us your effort Man, we're gonna run through bricks for you and be there, but we're gonna make we're gonna hold you because we know what it is to get you to where you wanna go. Yes. But we also wanna make you a better human being. Yes. And so that when you college years are over, not only did you get a chance to maximize your athletic ability, but we holistically worked on making you the best person you can be so you can go get a job and be successful in the real world. Because this athletics part all of us are involved with. Man, it is a small microscopic window in our life. And yeah, we enjoy it while it lasts, but when those days are over, what's what's remaining? 
even if I'm talking to a future NFL or NBA person or WNBA or whatever person out there, this window, by the age of 30, you're probably done playing sports the rest of your life. Yep. And and so what are you going to do for the next 45, 50 years of your life? Yeah. And you better have something to fall back on and that you've worked with and that you don't get to the end of that athletic career and say, oh, I don't know what I want to do or I don't know where to start. You haven't ever looked at it. You need to always be thinking of that. What's the plan B? Yeah. And have a plan B, you know, type scenario. Yeah. No, that is so good. That is so good. Thank you for sharing just those specific ways about coaching. You know, it's a great word for coaches and, you know, and how to build discipline, but you got to bring it with love. I love the John Gordon. I, I listen to him and read some of his books and I love how he said that it's love tough. <laughs> yeah. I love how he switched that around. Yeah. Like it's, it's loving tough, you know, instead of tough love. And I think that's so necessary. One thing that I, I like to tell, uh, athletes, especially injured athletes is don't, don't let their situation use you, you use it. And so what I mean yeah. by that is use it to show you how strong you can be. Use it, let the situation use it to get stronger. Don't let it use you by beating you up. I think if we can just have these, what my, one of my favorite words, perspectives, sharing perspectives with these young people and, and young adults, you know, to well, really... To, to- to, to that point, Taylor, is you know, if you come here just to play sports or go anywhere just to play sports and you don't go out there and get your college degree or make connections or plan for life, then you just let the system use you. Yeah. You know, you go use it. Use the system. Yes. Use the support system. Use the academic counselors. Use the, the trainers, the nutritionists, all the people there that are there for you to build you to the best person you can be. Use the heck out of them. I mean, maximize your resources and now use the university in return the same way. And so you're both getting something out of that experience. Yeah. And that when you're done, you've got something to show for it tangibly. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. One more thing is a perfect example of someone that I think when I was first injured, that my situation helped them see some things through a certain light. And now that person, as I look at them as somebody that inspires me, is uh, a lot of people that, that also watch motivational podcasts and things much like yours, Taylor, might know the name Inky Johnson. Yes. Uh, who's a very popular motivational speaker. And Inky was one of my former student athletes at Tennessee. He, I was at the game when Inky suffered a traumatic injury against Air Force. But for those that don't know him, he was starting defensive back at the University of Tennessee, had chances probably to go play in the NFL after college, and went up and made a tackle, and his helmet went back and pinched into his neck and shoulder area. And what they thought was a spinal cord injury because he went numb, ended up severing a major artery into his shoulder and arm, and he ended up losing permanent use of his right arm and ended up his athletic career obviously over. And now his right arm just hangs to the side of his body and he wears like a compression sleeve over the top of it. I left the game, went to the hospital that night to be by his family and, and just be there as a, as a couple of weeks he was in the hospital afterwards. And I, I was trying to get Inky to take a medical withdrawal for the semester okay, uh, so that he could focus on his injury and rehab and everything he was going to have to do. Yeah. Because he had a new life. He was right-handed. So... He had to learn to go how he was going to do life with a, only one arm. And, and it was a new world for him. You know, here's a young man that had NFL aspirations that came from nothing in Atlanta. And you can imagine, you know, his family was probably thinking, Inky's going to make it in life and be able to support the family. And that was his goal. But life changed for Inky just like it did. I would sit there and Inky refused to sign the medical withdrawal. He got out of the hospital just like my dad with me. And he went right back to school. He literally got out that morning and went straight to class uh, from the hospital. He refused to withdraw, like I told him. And he went back and passed everything that semester he had had the injury. And he graduated earlier than expected as well. Hardest working kid I've ever been around. And uh, ended up getting his, and went on and worked with John Gordon, Mm. who you were just referring to. Yeah. And learned how... John taught him a lot about motivational speaking and Inky got into that space and now he's 
very well known as one of the top motivational speakers. And now Inky and I still talk, but I get a lot of inspiration for someone that he looked at me because here I was all these years working with him at me initially. And now I look back at him and he inspires me. And it's kind of that full circle. Some of the things that are great about working in this, but we see resiliency from different points of view. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's something really, really cool. Wow. I have such respect for Inky Johnson. Heard him speak a number of times and I keep up with him. Yeah. Just very, very inspired by his words. How you do anything's how you do everything. I learned that from Inky Johnson. I heard him say that (laughs) one time and, and I just loved it. And I've tried to apply that to my life. And uh, so yeah, great connection. Absolutely. 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 Dan, thank you so much. You just got back from a honeymoon, your wife, and oh, just awesome. Just so excited for that. Your stepson and just just what the Lord is doing in your life. And just, Dan, I'm just so thankful for you. Thank you for your example. Thank you for being the role model. Your humility oozes out of the screen. Uh, I'm just so thankful for our friendship. And uh, thanks for coming on the Coach Ed Show. It's been a blessing and I'm grateful. And I uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. We will do it. All right. All right. Take care.